Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. This week, we help a homeowner that's right in the middle of a bathroom renovation and has a question about the shower that they're building, exactly what to do on the walls before putting the vinyl material that they're using. They really want to do it right. We help them out. Yeah, I mean, that's the time to make the right decision, right, Danny? You want to put up the finished material on your shower wall and realize the substrate wasn't the correct one. Um, And we're also going to talk to a homeowner who went out to buy a handsaw for a project she was working on and got completely confused with all the different sizes and styles of handsaw. So we're going to talk through some of the options and when you choose which handsaw for which project. We also look at a trending article on todayshomeowner.com about how to properly trim large tree branches. I'll tell you, if you've ever gone with your saw and cut a large branch and end up with a lot of damage on the side of one of your special trees, you'll want to hear the step-by-step and how to do it the right way. And I've got a simple solution, how to fix a loose baluster on a staircase using a toothpick. Okay, a lot of information for you. Let's get started. All right, let's go to South Carolina. We're going to try to help Debbie out with a little um, question that she has. Debbie, welcome to the Today's Home on the Radio Show. Thank you. Hi, Danny and Joe. It's always a pleasure to source insight from the Today's Home on crew. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Debbie. About two years ago, I caught this bug watching the Today's homeowner, and I began filling my garage with one tool after another. All right. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> great. I probably have two types, of, all but two types of mechanical saws. Now, growing up, I recall two items in my dad's tool arsenal, and that was the hammer and the long saw. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. My question is about hand saws, the numerous types. Uh, when do you use what? Which direction is right for the application, be it a push or a pull? Um, I recently saw a home show that was using a fine tooth saw to cut styrofoam. So right. when I went over to the local box, uh, big box store, uh, there was a large display of many types of saws from the hack saw, Japanese saw, keyhole saw, wallboard saw, bow saw, hand saw, et cetera, <laughs> and et cetera. That's right. So specifically, my question is, how do you know when to use what? Okay. And as always, I appreciate y'all's guidance. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, Joe certainly has worked on a lot of tool testing over the years with a lot of articles that he's written and everything. Uh, Joe, how would you answer that? You don't need every every saw in, in the book, but there's two or three that are pretty important. Yeah, you don't need every saw, but don't say that too loud in case my wife's listening because I try to buy it. Every <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you're, you're right, Debbie. I mean, you go into a store and you see all these, like, you go to the hammer section, and like 30 hammers. Like, why are there 30 hammers? Well, there are 30 hammers for a reason. They're actually probably about 60 hammers, but they're only carrying 30 because a lot of them have a design purpose. And the same is true of hand saws. Um, and to be as concisely, to say this as concisely as I can, typically um, the larger the saw and the the rougher cutting the teeth is more for like framing lumber or even plywood. If you have to cut anything that's not, um, you know, you don't have to have a really fine cut. If it's splinters, nobody really cares. But for finer work, for hardwood plywood or for fine hardwood, you want to use the smaller teeth, more teeth per inch. It cuts a little slower, but it cuts a little, uh, makes a finer cut. Now you refer to the Japanese pull saws and those are, are wonderful. And the reason that they work on the pull is the, blade is super flexible. All Western saws, American saws, for lack of a better term, cut on the push stroke. And because you're pushing it through the wood, the blade has to be pretty thick, right? And so if it's thick, it means you're removing more wood. It's more energy required to push that saw through. But with the Japanese pull saws, because you're pulling it, there's no tension on the blade as far as bending. So you can make it super thin. The teeth are super thin. And also the teeth are not set, meaning they're not bent alternately to the right and left to create a wide enough kerf to pull, or in this case for the Western saws, to push it through the wood. So for a lot of reasons, I use, I have a couple of Japanese pull saws I use for fine trim work, any smaller, but I mean, you're not going to use it to saw through a two by four, although you could, some of the bigger ones. But um, so, but the bottom line is, it depends on what you're cutting. Do you have a particular project you're working on, Debbie, that you wanted to buy a saw for? Oh, 
Not right now, but the next show may bring one to mind. <laughs> okay, well, I would definitely buy at least one Japanese pull saw. And Excellent. not to plug okay. any particular company, but I bought one at, at Harbor Freight online. It was incredibly affordable, like half the cost of anything else. And if you're not, if you're using it occasionally, that's all you probably would really need. Come to think of it, I was at Harbor Freight yesterday and I picked one up. Well, good, 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 good. 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 <laughs> hey, hey uh, let me share with you a little tip that was sure. shared that um, I learned when I was in my eighth grade industrial arts class okay. from the teacher who had an interesting name. His name was King David Wilson. And, wow. and King David was all, he was a cool, cool guy. And he taught me something that I use um, every time I pick up a handsaw. And that is instead of gripping the saw with your full hand, point your finger, your index finger, point it against, um, uh, as you're gripping it, just point it. And he says, use that, think of that finger as the saw, as you're cutting, and you'll be surprised. If you do that, you'll be surprised at what control you have on it. And it just makes it easier to cut a straight line. And I'll always, I can always think of King David every time I have that uh, finger pointed out like that. And I use it on uh, every saw that I've ever used with the Japanese pull saws, everything. So keep that in mind next time you grab that saw. Debbie, and I think you'll see what I mean. Wonderful. Okay. It's interesting how those things stick with us. Isn't that the with truth? Yes. <laughs> I really appreciate it. That's given me a little bit more insight, and I uh, have some direction to go on. So All thank right. y'all. Oh, our You're ple- welcome, Debbie. Our pleasure, Debbie. Thanks so much for being a part of the show, and I hope you have a great weekend. You as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. M- my shop teacher didn't share me that tip because I don't think he had that finger. Oh, that finger yeah. Well, yeah. yeah a lot of love- shop teachers needed two hands to order four beers, if oh, you know what I mean. Oh, boy. <laughs> yes. You don't want to. You, you, it, 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 that is good to have that finger. I guess I should have ca- had been a caveat on that one. One of the things that we're finding from time to time, uh, certain articles that are trending really big, really popular on today's homeowner.com. I'd certainly encourage you to drop by our brand new website that we relaunched just recently and uh, be able to take a look at over 4,000 videos, uh, 20 years of today's homeowner television shows, and a lot more information. But one uh, that we noticed was really trending a lot, and this is uh, certainly uh, good to look at during this time of the year, is how to trim large tree branches. Now, uh, one of the things you want to do here is if you've ever trimmed a a branch, a large branch, uh, improperly, then it probably scarred up the probably whole one side of the tree. Uh, Boy, it makes you feel so bad when that happens. So here's how you avoid it. Number one, the first thing you do is you want to cut a small notch in the bottom of the limb, two or three feet away from the trunk and about a quarter of the way through. This notch will keep the bark from splitting when you make the next cut. Yeah, and the next cut is, um, they call it a relief cut, and you cut just beyond that notch that you made on the underside of the branch. So you just go just beyond that a few inches, and you start sawing through, and you want to keep sawing until the branch breaks free. And what's going to happen is when it when you cut all the way, the weight of the branch will, you won't have to cut all the way through, you'll cut probably about three quarters of the way through, the weight of the branch will snap off and it'll fall. But because of that notch cut you made on the underside of the branch in step one, it'll break free. Otherwise, it'll peel that bark right across the rest of the branch down the tree, exposing it to damage at that point. So now at this point, you have the majority of the weight off of that. And this is the the final cut, the one that really matters. You know, it should be right where the branch collar, that kind of swollen bump that transitions to the smooth branch um, bark that you have. And you just follow the slant of the branch collar on the limb. And if you can't fit your saw into that um, at the right angle, then you can cut it from the bottom up. But it's very logical to get the weight off of it then you have a lot more control in cutting it nice and neat. So, so, you know, some of the common mistakes, you know, cutting the branch too short, leaving the branch too long, failure to make these relief cuts or something that uh, uh, you really want to make sure that you do it the right way. And this is a good time of the year to really look around and try to trim some of those limbs that may be a little diseased or getting too close to your house or your fireplace. Great time to take care of that, but just be real careful if you're cranking up that, um, that chainsaw. Now, a few 
of the comments we got here, Paul mentioned a very good article. I'm sending a copy to my hometown public works department and my brother. Both seem lacking in good technique. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, boy. Oh, Paul, I'm glad I didn't say your last name there. Wow. <laughs> wow. Here's another one Ron mentioned. Uh, the neighbor let his oak tree grow right on the property line, and it ate the fence. And now the roots are eating my foundation. I'm wow. using what I learned here to kill everything on my side of the property line and more. So, wow. uh, yeah, it's, uh, you always want to have a good neighbor, and when you have those trees that are right on on the line there. It's good to have a conversation about, um, you know, the health of that tree, maybe sharing the cost. And, you know, you're certainly sharing in uh, the raking of the leaves on both sides of the fence. So, uh, you know, maybe a kind of sharing the overall maintenance of that would be a good idea as well. And be sure you know exactly where that property line is. Yes, I, I believe yes. you have to check with your authorities in your town, but I believe legally, if your tree grows onto my property, I can slice off those branches. I can cut that's off right. anything that overhangs. And so that's why you see a lot of trees with like branches only on one side. Right, right. Um, so you got to be really careful about that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, a question along these lines. Uh, uh, Larry writes, um, I found your site by a web search and the instructions to trim at the branch collar is really great. What I was looking for is what to do if the collar was cut back and a donut hole has formed. So um, I, I, I assume there, um, Joey's talking about uh, just the look of that that hole more or less there right. um, and what you can do. I really don't know anything that you can do. The tree's going to work toward uh, correcting the look of that, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. He might be referring to if the branch, I've cut branches where I didn't realize it was rotted and it rots right through in the inside of the, the center of the branch and entering the tree is hollow, you know, because of disease or bugs or whatever. Um, and which brings up another question is, okay, so you cut the branch and they make all kinds of branch sealants. Some are spray, some are brush on, you know, which you're supposed to brush on to a fresh cut to seal it and prevent any disease. But I've also heard that that's not necessary. So we should really talk to a arborist. Maybe I'll call a local arborist and see what his feeling is because we should address that. Because um, I'm, I wonder if it's really necessary to seal it, in which case, like Larry, in this question, maybe you should seal it with something. But I don't know if that's even necessary. Well, well, I'll tell you, um, I read quite a bit about that. I guess it was about a year ago um, because we were doing um, – actually on the television show and having to trim some limbs. And I, and I checked on that. And right. the majority of the articles that I read from a, a number of the um, very reputable sites said – don't worry about it, that the tree's natural resin right. and so forth will seal that up. And if you paint anything on it, it will prevent that natural um, healing from occurring. And they said, you know, because the, the sealants will say you need to seal it to keep the bugs out. But right. it's just to the contrary of that. They said it may encourage the bugs because the natural uh, resin will not be able to form. So uh, that's what I've heard mostly. So. Okay, yeah. So so don't seal them, I guess. Is exactly, the exactly. So um, anyway, we'd love uh, for you to, to uh, participate on all of the many, many articles. We put up articles almost every day on today's homeowner.com. So check them out. I think you'll be surprised that a lot of the questions that you may have about your house right now are already answered and being talked about with our today's homeowner.com community. It's uh, time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Are you fed up with the dated look of your wood furniture? Well, with the passage of time and exposure to sun, tables, windows, and cabinets can seem, uh, start to look a little tired and faded. Verithane interior gel stains are a great way to create a deep, rich color and instantly enhance the natural grain of the wood. The thick stain provides twice the coverage of traditional oil-based stains and its consistency prevents drips and runs, so it makes it great for any vertical surfaces you might be working on. One quart covers up to 200 square feet and works great on even exterior surfaces as well. Just be sure to protect with polyurethane following its use. Now, to learn more about Verithane Interior Gel Stain, log on to homedepot.com. All right, right now we're going to go right to the phone lines. Uh, I want to talk to Bob's in North Carolina, who listens to us on 105.7 WRGC, the river in Syl Sylvain, North Carolina. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I was temporarily stunned. It's a pleasure and honor. <laughs> well, well, good. Well, this is fun. It's fun being on the radio and talking about home improvement, and uh, I hope everything's going well around your house. Not too bad. Uh, would be better if we get this 
uh, shower updated just a little bit for my parents. Okay. Um, Tell us all about it and what you're what you're planning on doing. Okay. Uh, it's just a real basic uh, three by five shower, putting in a, a pre made basin or whatever. Uh huh. And uh, want to put up just the four by eight fiberglass white plastic panels. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And not sure what to back it with. If you'd use half inch pressure treated plywood or hardy backer. Okay. And as far as what adhesive to put the panels onto that with. Okay. So you're going to uh, take this right back to the studs, I assume. Actually ground up because it's a older trailer. And so we're going back to the metal with uh, on the floor, rather, with three-quarters inch plywood. And uh-huh. then some of you had mentioned with the stud, pressure treated or because I'd read as far as doing like floor stuff, the pressure treated that it might warp more so than not treated. I don't think so. Not not if not if you're gluing and screwing it down like you should be. I don't think it would uh, be much of a problem. But on the walls, I tell you, you know, the uh, cement backer board is going to be the best thing to go with. I, I mean, I have seen people use treated drywall, uh, you know, moisture resistant drywall. I've seen treated half inch plywood, but. You know, it's one of those things you're not going to want to have to get back in there. So your best bet would be that cement backer board. Um, I, w- I would glue it to the studs with uh, construction adhesive. I would use screws. And then you do want to kind of do a little uh, finishing on the seams, much like you would drywall, by just using some okay. thin set adhesive and go ahead and put some fiberglass tape on it like you would, uh, like you could use for drywall. And then you just smooth it out just a little bit so that you don't have any chance of that crease showing back through and kind of transferring back through the plastic panels. Right, because they're thinner than if you had tile on it or something that would Got those scenes rather. Exactly. And, and I'll tell you on the adhesive, um, again, using a construction adhesive, and we recommend tight bond adhesive, one of the best in the country. And um, I would use, I, and, and instead of using a, a caulking tube of the material, I would actually put it on with a notched trowel. That way you get a nice, even coating over the whole entire thing. And then you can just push it right into the fresh adhesive and, you know, push on it a little bit. It won't won't take long for it to tack up and to adhere very, very well, and you won't have to worry about that coming down ever. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, what about the push and release method, if you will? I've seen where they put the panels up, uh, kind of pull it back so it you know, spider webs a little bit. Well, Bob, what a great thing that you brought up there. We, we like to call it burping, that you're actually burping, burping <laughs> it a little bit, which, you know, basically you're introducing air into those fibers. And, and uh, what Bob's talking about is anytime you're using construction adhesive, and we've used this a lot on applied molding that we've used on, like creating wainscoting on uh, dining room uh, walls and so forth, that you, you glue it, you put it in place, and then you just pull it out just a little bit and then put it back. It seems to really... Um, help for it to tack up quicker. I think that's a great idea. Well, fantastic. Um, and pressure treated uh, wall studs so we can put grab bars up later. Is that? I would do that. And I would also consider while you have the opportunity to maybe, um, you know, put some additional blocking, go ahead and make a reasonable guess where those um, grab bars are going to be, and then just turn. You could turn a two by eight, treat it sideways, screw it in between the studs, and you'll have a good place there that you know that you can attach that grab bar to. Brilliant. Um, real quick, last thing: the mud on those things. Since hardy backer is more of a concrete based substance, is it more of a, a mortar kind of mix, or is it regular like drywall? Style? No, no, not no. Don't use drywall. Use um, a thin set adhesive. It's a pretty generic type of thing that's used to glue, okay, for like tile, and like stuff. putting tile down and so forth. It's the same material. You might mix it just a tad thinner than you normally would, and then you can use a drywall trowel to uh, apply a six or eight inch wide swath over all of the uh, seams along with the fiberglass tape. Excellent, and screw heads not as crucial. I mean, if there's any big divot, yeah, you could hit the you could hit the screw heads if you wanted, but um, it wouldn't be as necessary. But while you have your um, your mud mixed up, it's pretty easy just to skim those out as well. Fantastic, you're my hero. Can't believe I got to talk to you and <laughs> appreciate all the advice. Anytime, Bob. We're happy to help you. And uh, next time, I might even let Joe talk a little bit. Nah, don't do that. We like your voice. No, I'm kidding. Joe. <laughs> he, he, always, he always says that, Bob. He always says that. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. And uh, have a great weekend and look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. All thank right. You. Well, thank you so much, Bob. That's great. Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention, Joe, and I know you're about to say that, is the 
advantage of him using a waterproofer like Redguard? Yeah, I mean, even though he's putting fiberglass over this, I would definitely apply a waterproofer. And if you've not if you're not familiar with this, it's basically like thick rubber paint, for lack of a better word. And you just roll it on, brush it on to the to the bare um, um, cement backer board, and that creates a completely waterproof seal. So yeah. if there is any penetration, hopefully the water won't soak through into the wall. We're going to be joined right now by Stuart, who has a question for us. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Ah, absolutely. Tell us about this mold and mildew issue. Boy, it just seems to plague everybody these days. Uh, how is it affecting you and your home? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what I'm seeing is that mildew growth on the ceiling right around all of the all fence in the bathroom. And also, strangely, along the drywall that's adjacent to the, uh, the attic access in a hallway. And this has been going on for several years. I've never wiped off any of the mildew around the exhaust vents, but I have the that area by that attic access cleaned it off with Clorox water blend, and it just keeps coming back. On the top side in the attic, I have I've checked there. There's no water leak. There's no, no uh, plumbing supply that's going across that area. Uh, so I just cannot figure out what is causing that. Yeah, it is. It can be very confusing. You know, in, in one of my um, secondary bathrooms that I don't go in very much uh, uh, with, um, when, when, since my girls have all moved out, but um, I went in the other day and it just had a tremendous amount of mold and mildew all around that particular um, air conditioner register. And so, you know, I thought, okay, well, why is this a humidity, a problem and so forth? And I went up in the attic and could see just a little bit of the, um, the insulation was torn, probably, you know, putting Christmas decorations <laughs> up there and back. Um, and, um, that was all it took in order to create that condensation, uh, to just drip a little at a time, soaking in around there. And it just was terrible. Now we were able to clean it off as you have. And so far, so good because we completely recoded that, used a, a duck mastic to solve all of that. But Joe, in a situation like this one, uh, what do you think around that attic stairs? Um, uh, you think this is a, a similar issue with basically some kind of condensation taking place? Yeah, well, Stuart, obviously, if you have mold and mildew, it's from moisture. And um, what people might not realize is that heated air has, you know, in, in winter, people typically have the heat on, even, you know, down south, and it contains moisture. And that moisture, if it gets up into the attic or through these vents, because, of course, the vents are open and uh, to let air in and out for mechanical reasons, for air conditioning and heating, or in the case of the attic staircase, it's probably not sealed that well. But basically what you have to do is block that. First, you go out and get Danny's favorite tool, a hygrometer, and check the humidity in and around there. Um, should really be 50, 30 to 50%, you know, no more than that. And if it's higher, then you got to reduce it um, and and seal as Danny said, if the, if the insulation's torn, if there's any gaps around there, and there almost always are gaps around registers and vents and attic staircases cut into ceilings, you have to just caulk them. You know, you can do it on the top side with foam, expanding foam sealant, on the underside with some clear or white caulk to match the ceiling. Um, but, but that's what you have to do. You have to just stop any air from inside the house leaking up in there because that's what's going to, that's what's causing the moisture. And if you don't have a attic, staircase cover. By the way, Stuart, thanks for sending these photographs because it'd be hard to understand your problem without seeing these. But the attic staircase that comes down, if you, sh if you don't have a cover over it, consider getting one. Um, you can make one or you can buy one. They sell them at Home Depot. There's one that I've used that works really well. It's called a Batic staircase cover. It's like the word attic with a B in front of it. I'm not sure what that's supposed hmm. to stand for. But hmm. anyway, the point is, if you put that on top, it'll help insulate it from above and maybe stop that warm, moist air from going up into that space. Okay. Yeah, I've seen those covers. So I don't know exactly what you're referring to. Oh, okay. good. I will, I'll, I'll try these, uh, these recommendations and see if that resolves the issue. Well, let, let us know if it works. Yeah, certainly hope that it does because that's an aggravating thing that uh, probably one of those things that uh, nobody sees but you, but every time you walk by there, you're going to be looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. It stands out to me. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today and hope you have a great weekend. You too. Thanks so much. Right now, we're going to switch gears, send it over to my buddy Joe Truini for our simple solution of the week.
All right, Danny, here's one, how to fix loose balusters in a staircase. Often the wooden balusters are tapered and round at the top and they fit into a round hole on the underside of the handrail. And what happens over time is the baluster might shrink a little bit and it'll be rattling around, in some cases even rotate. So what you wanna do is tighten up that baluster by, with a flat wooden toothpick, not a round one, the flat ones work much better. So what you do is take the wooden toothpick, smear a little wood glue on it, and just force it up into the hole. And depending on you know, how big the hole is, you might have to put one on each side. I wouldn't put two on one side, but maybe one toothpick on each side of the, of the baluster. But in any case, just jam it up in there. Um, then use a utility knife, because most of it will, the toothpick will be sticking out. It'll only go up maybe an inch or so. Just trim it off with a utility knife and wipe off. There'll be some glue dripping down. Just wipe it off with a damp cloth. And basically, that's it. And if you do that on two or three balusters, it'll stiffen up the entire um, handrail and baluster connections, and you won't have any rattling, and it certainly won't rotate out of, out of position. So try that if you have any loose balusters on your staircase. And I, and I would um, really suggest you take a close look at any of your baluster handrails inside and outside of your home, because if someone really needs to rely on that, if they stumble or fall or whatever and grab a hold of that, you want it to be there to where it will be substantial to protect them and keep them from getting injured. Recently, I've seen a, a number of situations like uh, uh, there's a, a show that's uh, one of the episodes of our Today's Home on Our Television show coming up where we corrected a problem like that because it was uh, so poorly done that when you push on the handrail a little bit, a couple of the balusters fell out. It was that bad. Wow. So we tightened that whole thing Self up. Self-ejecting balusters, I think they call it. Yeah, it was just wrong, especially you think of the kids and roughhousing around and such. So we were um, glad to be able to tighten up that situation and solve that problem. So, you know, if you have that or, you know, you have that situation, what do they call it? Slingshotting around yeah. the balusters. When you're coming up, you're grabbing it, you zip it up the stairs. Yeah. Or My son down. did that for about the first 12 years of his life. Yeah, 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 that will completely wear out a baluster. So need to make sure that you uh, check all of those. Very easy to tighten that up to keep your home safe because that's something we emphasize a lot here on today's homeowner is, you know, not just pretty things, but safe things. We're talking about, you know, uh, making sure your carbon monoxide detectors are good, your smoke detectors are good, that you're operating things in a safe fashion, especially during the winter months months with space heaters and things like that. That's an important part of being a good homeowner is making sure that your family's safe within the home. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week, and we would certainly encourage you to send us one by going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This comes from Donna down in Florida that says, I need some advice, please. I'm currently building an addition to the back of my home. I recently discovered that when the concrete finishers were pouring the concrete slab for the foundation, they removed the plastic vapor barrier. So now I'm looking for suggestions to fix the problems. Uh, should I insist that they redo the foundation, or is there another solution to guarantee I will not have a moisture and mold issue in the future. Is there another solution? Thank you in advance. That's a I don't know why. Um, you know, it, it's one of those one-shot deals that you're able right. to put a plastic vapor barrier down. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's just a garage. It's just a addition. It's just a whatever. Um, I put plastic down every single time because no matter what it is, you don't want that situation where you'll have a, 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 a surface that can um, have condensation on it, have moisture on it. That can be a slip and fall situation. But um, I guess in this case, the good news is it's a uh, a new slab, so you know you don't have a lot of shouldn't have a lot of stains or pain or anything like that on it. That would allow for a coating to go on it. And there's some really good um, masonry type coatings out there. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking the same thing. And Danny, and first of all, Donna asks, um, is there another solution to guarantee? I will not have moisture and mold issue. Well, Danny and I can both say there are no guarantees when it comes to most moisture and mold. I mean, we get questions every single week, and it just seems to be an ongoing battle. But in any case, yeah, Danny, there are moisture-resistant, I don't want to say moisture-proof, but there are certainly moisture-resistant um, sealers. They're either acrylic or polymer, and they're specifically designed for this situation. They're specifically designed for masonry surfaces, for concrete, block, anything like that. And they're used and they were designed and engineered for this problem where there wasn't a moisture barrier under the slab. And now what? Moisture is coming through. So I would wait 
Um, I don't. I forget how long we were supposed to wait, Danny, like 30 days or whatever it is. Yeah, for, 20, 28 days. 28 days for for um, a concrete slab to cure completely. Read the label really carefully because these are, if you buy a really good one, they're pretty expensive, but they're very effective and just apply it exactly as it's indicated by the manufacturer. And I think it'll probably solve the problem. Is it going to guarantee it? No moisture? No, but it'll certainly cut it drastically, reduce the amount of moisture she'll get through that slab. There you go, Donna. I certainly hope uh, that helps you and uh, certainly appreciate you listening uh, to our podcast. If you have a question, bring them on. You can send it to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And we also like to always uh, show our appreciation for all of you that have written these great reviews about the Today's Homeowner podcast. And also, if you have a suggestion on something that you would like to hear or a suggestion on how we can make the podcast more usable for you, then you we would certainly love to hear from you as well. Again, that's today's homeowner.com slash podcast. Well, that's pretty much going to take care of the podcast for this week. I'm Danny Lipford along with Joe Truini. We'll talk with you soon.